So I'm at, the, I'm at the beach a couple of weeks ago, and I'd finished the book that I had taken with me. And so, I mean, you know, like when you get an Airbnb or whatever, a lot of times they'll have different books just laying around. And I'm looking at some of those 782-page John Grisham novels. I'm like, nah, I only got a couple more days. So it was a tiny, tiny little paperback book. So I grabbed that one. And, and I started to read it, and it was about a, a time traveler, and he had gone thousands of years into the future. And this was what was really interesting to me. One of the first things that he discovered thousands of years in the future was that the normal distinguishable characteristics between the sexes were like being diminished. And basically, he began describing this society of weak men. The author was H.G. Wells, and the book was written in 1895. How many of you know that if he was beginning to see some things making their way into society, that we're seeing in some ways the fulfillment of those things? Church, we live in a society that has gone from diminishing masculinity to demonizing masculinity. Men, you are being told that masculinity, that power in male strength is evil. And I want you to understand something. When you begin to hear arguments made, when you begin to hear philosophical arguments made, you need to do two things. You need to ask what is the root statement of that argument. And if the root is true, then it has to be true in every area of life. So, so they'll give all the examples. Well, bad things have been, been done by bad men. Well no, well, no kidding, right? Like, there's this thing called sin, and it entered the world. And so, like, for thousands of years, bad things have been done by bad people. But if that is true, if masculinity is evil, then what they're saying, here's the philosophical statement. The philosophical statement is this. Strength is evil. Strength is evil. And again, if strength is evil, then that has to be true in every area of life. But we're hearing this. So we're hearing it preached in society that strong nations are evil. So don't be a strong nation because, again, bad things are done by strong nations. So you can't be a strong nation or part of a strong nation. And wealth, a strong financial position is evil. And so you don't want to operate in abundance and overflow. And wealth is evil. And so we got to tear down. Are you hearing this in society and culture? And and so, again, masculinity, masculinity is a symbol of strength. And so any expression of masculinity is evil. So, again, but it's got to be, if you you make that statement that strength is evil, it's got to be true in every area of life. So what about football? Uh, one of the parts of, the, uh, of a football team that is traditionally a strong part of the football team is what your offensive linemen, right? Those are, your, those are your big boys. Well, let's just take a look at this clip and see what happens when offensive linemen don't do what offensive linemen should do. Do we have that clip quarter, up there? Watch the Seminoles' offensive line. These four guys are right here. Oh, there's the snap. Okay, so we're gonna take the snap. We decide, uh, well, this one guy decides he's not gonna move. Zebra is standing there while the Seminoles quarterback, EJ EJ Manuel, is running around for his life. Sanders doesn't move, he's just standing there. Like he has no idea of what's going on. Where have you been, son? Come on, man. Say, come on, man. Come on, man. See, that's what. I got to admit, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant strategy by the enemy. So, so let me explain it to you like this. So if I've got 100 people on my team and I'm going up against 1,000 people and my 100 people, all we have, our only weapons are bows and arrows and I don't have Hawkeye or Katniss Everdeen or any of the elf people from Lord of the Rings. I don't have any, I don't have any of that. It's just me and 99 other people, and we got bows and arrows. And we're going up, we're going up against 1,000 people, and they have tanks. I mean, if you know, like, there is not much of a chance that I'm going to win unless, what if I did this? What if I convinced my enemy that tanks were evil? 
And what if I got them to begin to tear down the tanks from within their own camp? Oh, and by the way, the root of that is not just tanks are evil, but strength is evil. And so if you're got, getting caught doing push-ups, you get thrown in jail. And spiritual strength is evil, and so you can't read your Bible. you got to go in jail too. And mental strength is evil, so if you're reading any kind of books, you get thrown in jail too. Like, how many of you know that if I convince them that strength is evil, that I got a real good chance then of going in and taking them down? And I'm telling you, that picture of the offensive line where three of, my, three of my boys just don't block at all. It's like, here you go, half at them. Like, I don't know if the quarterback, did he do something wrong in the locker room? Like, I don't know what was going on. And there you got three guys, and then the one, the one guy's just standing there. I mean, the play is going on, but that is what the enemy is trying to get men to do in our society. Men, men don't use your strength. Don't use your strength. And the enemy's having a field day against not only the church, but our society. Can I tell you what the Word of God teaches? The Word of God never teaches that masculinity is evil. The Word of God never teaches that strength is evil. The Word of God teaches that evil is evil. And evil needs to be overcome by good manifested itself in strength. Let's go to the Word of God to see what the Word of God says about men. I want you to know in the middle of this series, men, no matter your age, I want you to know that you've come to a church where men can thrive. Masculinity can thrive. Biblical masculinity can thrive. Men thrive here because the Word of God says it. Daniel eleven thirty two. 32. But the people who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. 1 Corinthians 16, Paul affirms this. I love the similarities between these two verses. And Paul says this, beginning in verse 13, be watchful, stand firm in the faith. I love this line. Come on, Paul, preach this. He says, act like men. Say, act like men. Unless you're not sitting by men, then don't tell them that. But like... <laughs> I want to <laughs> preach this verse to our culture. Act like men. Be strong and let all you do be done in love. We need a recovery of biblical manhood. We need men to be men. Strong men, strong society. Where men thrive, the church thrives. Where men thrive, society thrives. James Garfield was the 20th president of the United States, served only 200 days in office before being gunned down. Garfield is the only president to be in ordained ministry. He's also the only president to become president who didn't start out running for president. 1880, Republican National Convention, and that's the 35th nominating ballot, and finally James Garfield's name gets nominated. He wasn't even on the original ballot. How did that happen? He went on to, to win the nominating ballot. He went on to win the, rep the, the presidency. How did that happen? Listen, I'm not a political scientist, but maybe you could trace this back to Garfield's statement a couple of decades earlier. As a young man, Garfield said this. He said, I mean to make myself a man. And if I succeed in that, I shall succeed in everything else. Men of God, let me give you several things from the book of Daniel this morning. Number one, men of God know God. Know God. But the people who know their God shall be strong. It's an if-then statement. You cannot be strong in your life without knowing God. Think of like in the movies. Who's the, who's the ultimate man? Is it William Wallace? Is it Clint Eastwood? Is it, is it Creed? I mean, those are all pretty good choices. But I'm telling you, none of those men compare to Jesus. They pale in comparison to that man who carried a cross. Listen to some of the characteristics of Jesus. Jesus took care of his mom. 
Jesus was the ultimate servant. He washed the disciples' feet. He stood up to the Pharisees and religious bullies. He loved and welcomed children. He protected children. If anyone harms one of these little ones, it'd be better for him to tie a millstone around his neck and be thrown into the sea. The enemy's having a field day with our kids because our men, he's trying to get the men just to be those offensive linemen. They're like, well, I guess, I guess I'm not needed. Right, that's, that's what you're being told, man. You're not, you're not needed. Don't be, st- don't be strong or you'll hurt someone. No, here's what happens when men are not strong. The innocent get hurt and the weak get hurt. Jesus protected kids. Jesus knew how to celebrate at weddings. He knew how to feast with friends, but he knew how to weep at funerals. Jesus knew how to get alone and pray with God. And Jesus was beaten, accused, spit on, and carried a 350-pound cross down the Via Della Rosa with raw flesh hanging off of his back, took a crown of thorns, seven-inch nails in his hands and feet. That is the ultimate man. How did Jesus do what he did? Let's ask him. He tells us in the book of John, John chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, the Son of God can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son does also. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Men of God, can I just throw this out? If Jesus Christ, while he walked this earth, needed God to do everything in his life, then you need God you need God and men it is not a sign of weakness to admit your dependency upon God it's a sign of strength if Jesus said I can do nothing without God then men it is a sign of strength in your life to say I can't do this on my own I can't be a husband I can't be a father I can't be a protector I can't be a defender unless God helps me to do that we need men of God who are dependent upon God like never before and who aren't afraid to show it. Men of God, can I encourage you? Draw your strength early in the morning before you check ESPN to see if your sports team won. Check to see what the Word of God says about you. Before you go through the news cycle of the day, open up the book of Psalms and begin to read that out loud over your heart, over your mind, over your family. Men of God, if you'll get in the word of God like never before, God will begin to use you like never before. Men of God, don't be afraid. Don't ever let the world or any religious person in the church tell you that worshiping your God is a sign of weakness. You don't be afraid to sing out, to lift a hand, to let a tear roll down your cheek as you worship you become a warrior and God fills you with his power men of God become men of prayer that call out in prayer for our families for our culture for our society men of God know your God and be strong be strong but the people who know their God shall be strong I I heard a story read a story about Charles Lindbergh May 20th, 1927, Roosevelt Field in Long Island, New York, 7.52 a.m. 25-year-old pilot named Charles Lindbergh fired up his single-seat, single-engine airplane, the Spirit of St. Louis. He took, he took off. He almost, he almost ran out of runway, but he didn't have any brakes, so it didn't like he just had to go for it. And he climbs up uh, uh, in, into the air. Half a dozen pilots had failed before him. He was looking down in the Atlantic Ocean. He couldn't tell the exact spot, but like counting the one, the two, the three, the four, the five, the six that had tried this run and were somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic. He didn't have the most experience. He was a male, a male pilot. He delivered mail, a handful of barnstorming exercises. He had, he had no radio and no fuel gauge. He say, that sounds like my first vehicle outside of college. Would you drive that across the Atlantic? No, like no, no fuel gauge. So, <laughs> how many of you know, sometimes it's just better not to know. <laughs> He gets close to land. He sees a fishing boat. He didn't know where he was. 
he sees a fishing boat in the fog off the coast of Ireland, and he goes down to 10 feet, yells out, hey, am I near land? The fish, the fish man was so startled, he didn't even answer him, and he kept going, finally makes it to the Eiffel Tower, circles around the Eiffel Tower, lands his plane, 25 thousand people cheering he got so much fan mail after that that the the united states post office had to hire 35 extra employees just to sort through his mail you say like where did charles Lindbergh get that kind of toughness i don't know probably from a lot of sources but maybe from his grandfather august Lindbergh. so august Lindbergh immigrated to the united states several decades uh, before that from sweden ended up in minnesota worked at a sawmill tripped and fell at the sawmill one day and fell chest first, torso first into a saw. Eyewitnesses say that they could see his, his heart beating through his chest. So they picked him up, took him home where he waited three days for a doctor to come amputate his arm and sew him up. How many of you know that's some toughness? So, and I, and I'm, I'm sorry, tell me, again, tell, tell me again the reason that you're not serving God. I mean, does anybody like... Oh, oh, somebody offended you? Somebody triggered you? They said something? I mean, you don't have to answer to me. You just have to answer to the one who went to the cross for you. I'm just, I'm just saying, like, maybe, maybe it's time we toughen up a little bit. Like, maybe it's, maybe it's time we took our grandfathers, our great-grandfathers out to lunch and say, hey, granddad, tell me what it was like. And then maybe we wouldn't complain about the things that we got to go through today. Be strong. Be strong. Remember Rocky Three rematch with Lang? Rob, Rocky's taking it on the chin over and over again, but he does so intentionally. Right? He's just leaning in. You ain't so bad. You ain't so bad. And, and uh, Apollo, Apollo looks at him and he says this. He says, you're getting, he's getting killed. But Pauly had a different take. Pauly said, nah, he's getting angry. He's getting angry. Man, can I tell you that Jesus got angry and it's okay to get angry if you channel your anger toward the right things. See, the devil's trying to get you to be scared of your own anger. Hear my heart? Right, Lisa? We've seen, we've seen anger do horrible things. Amen? Not making any excuses for any kind of things, anger expressed in the wrong way. But here's what I know, that Jesus had a righteous anger that he used to step in and defend and protect people. Men of God say, God, instead of taking this anger away, redirect it so that I can be effectively used for your kingdom. Amen? Be strong. And do exploits. Do exploits. But the people of God who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Let me speak to the dads in the room. Dads, sometimes we can feel the tension between work and family, right? Especially when it comes to our, our time. So part of one of the things that the Lord has uh, given men to do and that it's within us as we want we want to be a provider and so he provides us our job to be a provider and that's a good thing but how many of you know that sometimes that very role can take us away from the ones that we're providing for and sometimes that can be a tension a few weeks ago I was in Nicaragua and it was in the middle of a busy travel season and so I was kind of wrestling with that right of like doing what I knew that God had called me to do but I was away from Camden the kids and uh, so just wrestling with that a little bit, early in the morning I'd woken up and got my cup of coffee and grabbed my Bible and walked out onto the balcony, the mountains there in Okatal and the sun's com coming up. And I just, you know, I felt the Lord just bringing some refreshing there. And I, I wrote this down and I, I said, gave these statements, they're in your notes. I said, we empower men, we empower dads, we empower our kids by giving them the gift of our time, presence, and attention. But dads, also hear me, we also empower our kids by living our lives to the fullest, chasing dreams and demonstrating to them what a full, brave, and courageous life looks like. So I want my kids growing up knowing their dad as the dad who was at their dinner table and the ball game, but I also want them to know their dad who was running mountains and planting churches. Like, so dads, I just want to encourage you with that of those both 
can be possible. Be strong and do great exploits. One of my one of my favorite presidents has become Teddy Roosevelt. I just finished a, a biography on, on Teddy Roosevelt, October 1912. Uh, Teddy is running for president, and he's standing before, and he's given a speech, and a would-be assassin takes a 32 caliber handgun, shoots him, and a bullet lodges two inches in his chest. Have you, have you heard this story? And so Teddy Roosevelt is standing up there, gives, is giving the speech. The bullet hits him in the chest. He pauses, and, and his response was to the crowd, I'm so sorry. He said, the bullet is now within me. He said, I won't be able to talk very long. And then he proceeded to give a 53-minute speech with a bullet lodged two inches in his chest. At the end of the speech, he's standing in a pool of his own blood. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, as you, as you uh, go through his life, I mean, just an amazing, the guy rode a moose, took down an armed cowboy during a barroom brawl, crossed a frozen river to chase boat thieves, worked a ranch in the Dakotas, flew the Wright Brothers airplane, scaled the Matterhorn in the Swiss Alps, went month-long on African safaris, navigated uncharted parts of the Amazon River, led the charge up Kettle Hill during the Battle of San Juan, and he set up, in a, a, set up a boxing ring in the White House just in case any of his opponents wanted to step in the ring. Like, again, we need, we need to hear the stories of that guy of masculinity, of those kind of people that stepped out and did amazing exploits. Man of God, I want to encourage you that you are here for such a time as this. The same God that was in Daniel that allowed him to stand against a godless culture in a lion's den. The same God that was in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that fiery furnace. The same God that throughout history of civilization has called great men to rise up during challenging times is available for you this morning. Came across this a couple of weeks ago. There was a history professor at the University of Edinburgh in the late 1700s. And he began to go back and he began to study thousands of years of great civilizations. You know, he studied the Chinese, he studied Egypt, he studied Israel, he studied the Greeks, he studied the Romans. And as he studied these great civilizations, he began to notice a pattern that emerged in all of these great civilizations. And here's what the pattern looks like. He said, the great civilizations go through these cycles. They go from bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance. But instead of using their abundance to serve others, oftentimes the abundance then leads to selfishness. Selfishness then leads to complacency, complacency to apathy, apathy to dependency and dependency back to bondage. It's interesting, isn't it? spent a little time with that and and this is this is just Doug's opinion I started to look at this and I just started to look at our culture our society and say where where are we at my first inclination was to say well we're we're going back into dependency and then I thought no we're beyond that we're we're moving as a culture back into bondage but then I was reminded of this, and I think it'd be interesting to take this cycle and to overlay it over the book of Judges, because that was Israel's cycle, wasn't it? Just over and over again. But I was, I was reminded, and so Judges, you can read Judges with a, with a heavy heart of saying they, they never got it, and they just kept going back into bondage, and they kept, but, but I was encouraged, I was actually, when I thought of Judges, I was actually encouraged, because every time the Israelites were in bondage, there were some people that said, hey, we're, hey, we're the, hey, we're the people of God. 
We're not meant to live in bondage. Like this isn't our heritage. This isn't our destiny. They begin to look back at their ancestors and they begin to say, like sometimes it was just one person that would stand up. And sometimes it was multiple people, whether it was Josiah or Deborah, they're different people. And they begin to go from bondage back into spiritual faith. And can I just tell you that while we may be viewing our society as a culture that's leading back into dependency and in to bondage that I believe that once again specifically for the purposes of our message this morning that God is raising up great men of God that will say I am not going to pass this culture onto my children onto my grandchildren without giving it everything that I got and long as long as I got breath in these lungs I'm going to stand I'm going to fight I have strength within me I got exploits within me my God I'm going to know my God my God's going to empower me with strength Church, that promise was given in the book of Daniel when Daniel was in the middle of Babylon. It was not a culture that was serving God, but God's promise to the men of God is in the middle of a godless culture. He is empowering you with the strength that you need to do great exploits for your God. But I'm telling you, it won't come easy. It's going to take great courage it's gonna take great courage but I want to remind you of who your father is I want to remind you you can do nothing except what you see your father doing and I want you to see your father in heaven blessing you I want you to see your father in heaven speaking life over you I want you to see your father in heaven telling you that you were born for such a time as this men of God stand to your feet stand to your feet all across this auditorium men of God God, I want to bless you this morning. I bless you. I bless you to know your God. I bless you to know the word of God. I bless you to be worshipers and to be warriors. I bless you to surrender your lives to Jesus Christ. I bless you to be strong. I bless you to be strong mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and relationally. I bless you to use your strength to serve the less fortunate and to serve those who can't stand up for themselves. And I bless you men to do great exploits. And whether your exploits exploits are known nationally or only within the confines of your home. I bless those exploits to set people free. I bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now would everybody stand in this room with heads bowed and eyes closed all across this auditorium the son of god himself said i can do nothing except that which i see my heavenly father doing can i remind everybody every man woman and child in this auditorium every teenager every single every young adult can i remind you today that you can do nothing without jesus and maybe there's somebody here that would say pastor i've been trying to do it on my own own and I need to surrender my life to Jesus if that's you you've allowed pride to get in the way you've allowed stubbornness to get in the way and you would say pastor I don't want to do that any longer I want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ when I count to three I want you to be a man or woman of courage I want you to be a person of courage and lift up your hand and say I want to surrender my life to Jesus if that's you one pastor I'm done doing it on my own pastor I'm ready to surrender my life to Jesus three come on if that's you have the courage to lift your hand high I got you who else would say that's me that's me that's me who else would say that's me I want to lift I want to lift up my hand and acknowledge Jesus church family let's all surround let's surround those who are going from death to life today let's speak this out let's pray this prayer together and say Jesus I come to the cross I ask for forgiveness I ask you to come into my heart and to come into my life and help me to live wide awake to the love of God and fully alive to my purpose 
in Jesus' name. Well, I hope the service today made a difference in your life. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus, we would love to know. All you have to do is download the app and click I'm new. We have resources we'd love to give you as you begin your journey in following him. It is still April. It is April. So... April showers. They bring May flowers. Do they though? I think so. But they don't? I don't know. It's just a poem. I don't know if it's actually really true. If it's In not every true. part of the world, definitely. So not. you're saying we've been lied to the whole time? Like, what if it doesn't rain in April? Uh, exactly. That's what I'm talking about. Do we then get June flowers? What if we get April flowers? Or August flowers? We do get flowers in April. We get flowers in really April. It really could be March flowers bring April showers. Or sh I mean... <laughs> <laughs> The flowers bring the rain. <laughs> Too much thinking. Too hard. So if we have flowers bringing showers now? I like if, it to smell flowery in the shower. What if it should be, if you play in the flowers, then you need to take a shower? Yes, that is definitely, it should be that. Playing in flowers means taking showers. Or if you eat a flower, you get a superpower. Oh. Whatever, it doesn't matter. We're in April. Eat a flower, take a shower. Do it. <laughs>